I think it's about time. I'm glad so many of you were able to uh, stay till the end of the meeting. Um, I know that for some of you going to the East Coast, um, staying to the end of the meeting um, presents some uh, dilemmas, red eyes, an extra night, uh, or slipping out a little early, but I think we are going to really um, make it worth your while for staying this afternoon. So, welcome back to the closing plenary. Uh, before we move on um, to the uh, main event, I've just got a couple of things I want to do. Um, I want to just remind you of a couple of um, announcements in your packet. Um, one is for the Designing Libraries Conference, the date of which and location of which have just been announced. Uh, another is for the JISC CNI meeting in Oxford this summer, and I hope I'll see at least one or two of you there. And um, finally, of course, the date for our December meeting. I want to note, by the way, that we are well along on planning for another digital um, uh, scholarship um, center um, workshop. Uh, we're not quite ready to announce that yet, but we will announce that on CNI Announce when it's ready. With those housekeeping announcements, I want to say thanks to a few folks before doing anything else. Um, we had an amazing number of presentations at this meeting. As we've restructured the schedule a bit, we've been able to accommodate a lot more presentations because we have room for 30 minute as well as longer presentations. Uh, so you've heard from an awful lot of uh, people who have um, contributed to this program and I'd like you to join me in thanking all of those folks. Thank you. I would also like to thank the CNI staff for putting this meeting together and along with the staff I'd like to um, express some special thanks to two wonderful uh, volunteers from San Diego State University who helped us uh, to capture a number of additional parallel sessions on uh, voice over PowerPoint uh, so that we have those available for, to, for you and uh, for your colleagues going forward. So I'd really like to thank the whole team that made this meeting run as smoothly and effectively as it was. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to introduce our closing keynote speaker, Professor Larry Smarr. Larry and I were trying to figure out a few minutes ago exactly how far back we go. And we're pretty sure it's at least 30 years. Um, uh, back to the days when I was at the University of California and he was at the um, National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Uh, you have a sort of a stock bio um, of Larry in your, um, in your uh, program, but it really doesn't in many ways do justice to what a force he has been for advanced computing and for the convergence of advanced computing and advanced networking to, advan to support scholarship over decades and decades. He was one of the key architects of the program that really brought what was then called supercomputing into the mainstream of science and engineering in the 80s through the um, NSF Supercomputing Center program. Um, and as part of that, he wound up as the founding director out in um, Illinois uh, Champaign-Urbana for the National Center for Supercomputing Activities. Um, that operation changed your life more directly than some of you may remember. Um, 
Larry hired a bright graduate student by the name of Mark Andreessen, and they produced a little thing called Mosaic, which was the first graphical web browser, and really, in many ways, for better or worse, was the the fuel that really made the World Wide Web take off. Before then, it was textual links and very much a line mode kind of affair. Um, so that was an absolutely transformative uh, moment. By the way, I was looking back, and if you were going to CNI meetings in the very early days, back in the early 90s, you would have had a um, very early look at Mosaic um, in a session called Navigators and Navigation, um, which CNI put on in, its, uh, in one of its first meetings. Now, Larry has gone on to do all kinds of amazing things since then. Um, uh, he has been central to many of the advances in high-performance networking, in thinking about cyber infrastructure. Uh, he has served as a key advisor to the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, the National, um, uh, the Na the NASA. Um, uh, he has done... Um, incredible service for our government and uh, for the progress of science. You may have seen work he did some years ago on the Optiputer, uh, which really, I would say, fundamentally changed the way we think about really big displays and really high resolution displays and visualization. And um, in recent years, he has been one of the drivers of something called the, um, uh, the uh, California Research Platform, um, which is now evolving beyond California into a genuinely national program. I mean, it actually was reaching outside of California rather rapidly, but now it's, it's, it's serving as the seeds in some way for a genuine next step in nationwide cyber infrastructure. And I think what he's going to do today is tell you about that and try and place it in a, a sort of a historical and evolutionary context. Um, I've been hoping to get Larry to address CNI for a long time. Um, this is his hometown, and uh, these days at least, and so it couldn't have worked out more perfectly. Please join me in welcoming Larry Smarr. Well, thanks very much, Cliff. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here because actually, although I'll take you through uh, sort of the frontiers of big data uh, networking and computing and so forth, actually what's left to be done is what you do. Uh, so at the end, we're going to come back to uh, data discovery, uh, curation, annotation, and uh, in a whole new world that you haven't worked in before, uh, where everything's going from 10 to 100,000 megabits a second. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, it's important to understand how these things happen uh, from the federal agency point of view. So I'll take you back over 30 years ago to when Sid Karen and I wrote the proposals, I wrote mine in 83 and his in 84, to an NSF that didn't have a program to create national supercomputers uh, centers. And uh, that changed very rapidly. But the reason was that we cloned the Department of Energy supercomputer facilities, the idea of mass store, the idea of vi visualization, which was light green on dark green uh, at that time. Uh, in which the graphics commands were lift pin, move pin, drop pin, move pin, <laughs> pull pin up. <laughs> um, but 
that is what we brought over because we'd worked, I and Livermore and um, Sid in MFE, Magnetic Fusion Energy Network. And, and so this is a once in sort of three decade event when the Department of Energy, where there's, you know, the nuclear weapon program and a lot of other things keep, you know, get things to happen earlier. Well, I'm here to tell you that 30 years later, it's happened again. And this is probably the biggest change in NSF funding for your campuses in its history. Um, the DOE came up with this notion as big data at continued to exponential it from all the scientific instruments, for instance, and clusters and so forth on your campuses, and came up with this idea of something called DMZ. Now, they might have come up with a better name, but we're stuck with this. And I, I'm not going to have many word slides like this, but just to show you, Fundamentally, it says that there's a separate network on your campus for scientific or engineering or humanistic or social science big data, and that that uh, requires special data transfer nodes to uh, hold the data and terminate the optical fibers, basically. Um, and then you do a lot of performance and uh, testing and, and throughput uh, of this, and you have a different security mechanism than just something like firewalls. So DOE uh, coined this term in 2010. Uh, we had actually at UC San Diego gotten NSF proposals, the Optiputer that um, Cliff mentioned in 2002, and then we had built the first uh, campus-wide uh, version of this uh, back in 2004. And that plus the, an NSF workshop called the um, report called the Campus Bridging Task Force led the NSF to start a program which is rather phenomenal and yet not that well understood or known about. Um, and this is the Campus Cyber Infrastructure Program which over the last five years had made over 200 campus level awards uh, in 44 states to establish separate 10 to 100 gigabit um, big data, think of it as like LA freeway, right? Inside the campus, uh, but a big freeway for data separate from the uh, commodity internet. Let me put an example. At, at UC San Diego, there are probably 40,000 users of the commodity internet, and they run all over one 10 gigabit backbone. Now this is where I give you a 10 gigabit to 100 gigabit just for your data. So that's the difference. And here's an example of one of those awards. The, we call it the PRISM, UCSD PRISM Award. And we now, so we've had now, since the predecessor of this court site and then this one, probably 30 or 40 different sites on campus where we have direct 10, 40, 80, 100 gigabit uh, access to physics department, biology, Scripps oceanography, and so forth. And then there was a separate uh, CC award to put a 100, 100 gigabit per second link between the uh, SDSC and um, Scenic, the campus, the, the California Research and Education Network. Here's another example. This is just one of those 30 or 40. This is Rob Knight's lab, uh, who's he's one of the, the leaders of uh, microbiome analysis producing. We're, we're running, he and I are running about a million CPU hours a year on the Comet supercomputer. That's about a... It's so a bit more than a CPU century, so that run your computer 24 hours for 100 years. We use that much per year. So to generate data from a massive sequencing, genetic sequencing of your microbiome. Well, that data goes from his lab <clears throat> to, from the gene sequencer to his lab over to Cal IT2, my institute. Qual uh, Qualcomm Institute is the UCSD version uh, branch of it. And then at 120 gigabits a second over to SDSC, where he has a thousand node cluster, but there's also the supercomputers there. And then if you need to bring down data, you can go across the internet too and bring it from places like um, NCBI, um, which is where the biological data, genetic data is at NIH. Also, we have a $10 million grant from IBM to uh, tutor Watson in the microbiome so that it can actually um, add that. So the logical next step, which was a proposal I put in a few years ago to the NSF, is to link together 
many of these campus uh, DMZs into a regional DMZ. And we have all 10 of the UC campuses, the three privates, Stanford, Caltech, and USC, and then uh, one of the Cal State, San Diego State, and then up to the University of Washington. And that runs, uh, because the only way we could afford to do this was because of the investment of all of the members of Scenic, the Research and Education Network, over all these years that has produced probably the best um, optical regional network in the world. Um, now, the interesting thing is this isn't a networking exercise, <laughs> although it is an exercise, but we are looking for how it changes the workflow, the, the, the use cases of scientists who are in distributed multi-campus teams generating big data in many different fields. And so there are over 50 uh, top scientists that are uh, part of this, as well as the CIOs and network officials from um, at least 30 campuses. Now to put this in perspective, the funding for this is about three FTEs a year. So this is probably the largest volunteer activity in the history of networking uh, in the US. Uh, and it's a great experiment to see what happens. Now again, we couldn't do it without this amazing thing called Scenic. It's a nonprofit. I've been on its board for 15 years or so. But it provides the networking to 10,000 K through 12 in California, 100, over 100 community colleges, all the Cal State, 23, two dozen of those, the ones I just mentioned, uh, privates, California. But also, uh, the latest edition is almost 1,200 California libraries. And in fact, the LA Public Library has, is the first library to have a 100 gigabit per second connection to Scenic. So in case you think libraries aren't a part of this, uh, actually, some of them are at the point of the spear. And because the, uh, there's 20 million Californians using Scenic, it's not for commercial, it's not, it's just the university you know, research community and the, and the education research community. Um, but it connects 12,000 sites, uh, you know, it's just amazing, 8,000 miles of optical fiber. So knowing, helping having built that up over the last 15 years is why I, uh, knew we could do this in California. Most places are going to be more difficult, but you have regional networks everywhere. And I'm working with the Quilt, which is the organization of regional networks. Uh, and there are many regional networks that are now following our lead on this. Now the thing is, if I come to you and give you a fiber optic, and I said, the good news is, you now have about a thousand times the speed of the internet you've been having, uh, plug it in. Well, to what? You know, I got that blue Cat 6 thing. I got, I got lots of plug-ins for that, okay? Where, what do I do with this thing? So there are, of course, optical plug-ins now. Most, you know, Mac laptops have had a gigabit or a 10 gigabit plug-in for a long time. But um, just take a PC, you can get a 10, 40, 240, 100 gigabit network interface card. And so we decided to build on the commodity base. That's what I've always done because the commodity base gets, you know, much more powerful every year without you spending any money on it. And so you basically imagine a, a big data PC. Now the thing about it is if you're going to have to be accepting data at that speed, you have to have really fast storage. So the rotating storage isn't going to cut it. So we use SSDs and we put in terabytes of SSDs, solid state disk, uh, in these things. And in fact, more recently, the non-volatile memory is even faster than that. Um, and that can keep up with this flow and keep TCP from backing off as it traditionally would have done at, at these speeds, particularly at these distances. Um, and so we developed this very simple concept called Fionis, which are flexible IO network appliances. <clears throat> and <clears throat> because what we're interested in is not uh, campus gateway to campus gateway. We're interested from your disk to the disk you're trying to get to at these speeds. Now that's an unnatural act because 
if you're in a building on a campus, your department determines the networking in that building. Then the campus CIO determines it on the campus. <clears throat> then the wide area network vendor. Then another CIO who does things differently on their campus, on the remote campus, and then a different department, right? Now, that's why nobody had the job of guaranteeing you have disk-to-disk -disk good connectivity. So I thought, that's great. I'll apply for that job. And that's what this grant basically does. So we invented Pill Papadopoulos in particular on the, on the PRISM grant, came up with this thing. And you can see there for under $10,000, you can have um, these, um, these terminating devices. But the thing that's cool is, imagine you only need a gigabit per second sustain. We can do that for $250. And so we're now in our workshops, actually having workshops where we, we train people up on these and then give them to them. And then they go home and plug them into their network and begin to debug their campus network and their relations to others. What that lets you do is imagine now that the Fiona's are, you know, like this thing is the terminating device for both the wireless internet and Wi-Fi, right? Your PC is the same for the wired internet. So these are terminating devices for the, for, the, for the dedicated optical fibers. So what we do then is we can use like grid FTP to uh, actually move a 10 gigabyte file four times a day between all of the Fiona's. So these rows and columns are just all the different endpoints. Well, when we started, You'll notice that orange means we couldn't get ping to work. But by last summer, the green means that you have five gigabits a second disk to disk throughput four times a day as measured. And we have now extended this so that is now uh, up at 30 gigabits a second that we're using uh, on the, these things called Mad Dash, which again, the Department of Energy developed. Now, how many of you know about Kubernetes? Okay, the rest of you need to get on the, the bandwagon here. Uh, this is an extraordinary thing because fun fundamentally what we're doing is building a distributed computer, but it's like a single computer because the fiber optics are faster than the backplane of your local cluster. So although there may be speed of light latency, it's essentially acting like it's all in one rack. And um, so who else does that? <laughs> Google has created a worldwide set of data centers connected by fiber optics. And when you do one of a billion searches a day that Google handles, um, they replicate that at multiple sites, multiple data centers, right, just for, so that you don't lose anything. The same goes with a lot of the other stuff, Google, Amazon, all these guys do, Microsoft. And so Google actually decided we have to figure out how to do that. Well, first of all was the idea of containers. So you take your software they want to execute, put in containers, and uh, Docker and other things have been doing that for years, but now at Google everything that is software runs in a container. That then can means that it can go around and be and drop onto any computer and it has enough internal information to execute on that machine with no human intervention. So then you need something to orchestrate this flow of different containers with different software across multiple data centers and so forth. And so they developed that software into what is called Kubernetes and they made it open source and gave it to us. Now this is hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, development and, and testing, right? Now, many companies started saying, well, this looks like a good thing, we're gonna use it. So in 2017, basically Kubernetes conquered the world. And there are now over 40 uh, major companies, including all the cloud providers that support uh, Kubernetes. This is a whole nother game because now, essentially with this middle layer, you can, in, you can actually treat this distributed computer finally, after 30 years of journey toward this point, as a single computer. You just throw your container on it and it takes care of things. Now it's a little more complicated than that. But um, anyway, the point is that uh, this also does something that we haven't even begun to really think about. 
which is that because the cloud providers have, have adopted it, this means if you're running on your local cluster or local computer and you have an account on one of the cloud providers, it just transparently can be going over to the cloud when you want it to. Whereas before, it's always this big barrier, right? How am I going to get to the cloud? So uh, we are now using this aggressively across, um, across the Pacific Research Platform. But it gets better. Here comes the Ginza knives, particularly for you folks. OK? And that's storage. So as you know, Ceph was developed at UC uh, Santa Cruz as a um, uh, object storage system. Uh, Rook has been developed as an open source um, file blocks object store system, which is runs under Kubernetes and then runs on top of uh, Rook, and it's a cloud native software. So I don't want you to look at this in much detail, but those are all universities that have these Fionas, and you can look underneath them and see 40 gig, like at the top UCLA, that's 40 gigabits a second disk to disk, and each Fiona has 160 gigabyte terabytes of rotating storage. So we're deploying about uh, two petabytes of rotating storage across this specific research platform. Now we've been having a lot of uh, workshops and we'll have many more uh, to both focus on the tech, focus on the applications, like if you have applications, how do I get onto this thing and so forth. Um, but of course we were driven by the applications that we brought to the proposal and I went out and you know hunted down the leaders of a bunch of these fields that um, I knew were generating massive amounts of data and were multi-campus collaborations. Life's not long enough to go out and find people who aren't collaborating with each other and get them to do it. Okay? So I figured, okay, <laughs> we got a lot of things to do here. Let's start with the folks who are already, so the LHC, the tier one, two, three, uh, four centers around the world, they, they've already know how to work with each other. So actually Frank Wertheim, who's the executive director of the Open Science Grid to where a lot of the computing goes on, um, is the co-PI on the Pacific Research Platform by, uh, you know, by design. But here are the ones we're using. So let me just give you an example. When you couple the local area PRISM network on the UCSD campus with the Pacific Research Platform, which by the way, goes all the way to Chicago to Starlight as well as to Hawaii within the United States. Um, he is then looking at uh, big file transfers uh, from his cluster up in the physics department on the UC San Diego campus to Fermilab uh, to the tier one center for uh, the CMS experiment. And what you'll notice here is these, these things are about uh, five minutes but at the bottom apart, and that's uh, 30 uh, gigabits per second sustained over about 15 minutes. So, so actually sustaining these things, not just peak, uh, is now quite possible. And this is, again, across the campus, across the wide area, back into Fermilab and so forth. Um, now, what that allows uh, you to do is, uh, we worked with the Santa Cruz folks who are really uh, very good um, uh, on this DMZ thing and uh, have a great team there. And they also have a, a lot of astrophysicists and astronomers, one of the best groups in the country. And they've done a lot of supercomputing on uh, NERSC, uh, the uh, DOE's supercomputer at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Well, how do you get your data back? And, and you'd say, well, what am I going to do with if I have terabytes of data, you know, at NERSC, how am I going to get it back? What am I going to do with it? Well, it turns out these folks have over a thousand node cluster just for astronomy and astrophysics, Santa Cruz. So they can do a lot of science analysis of the data locally, but they had to get it back. We now have a hundred gigabit per second link between the Heides cluster at Santa Cruz and NERSC supercomputer, Cori, and uh, that was such a major step forward that Scenic in its annual uh, meeting earlier this year awarded them their Innovations and Networking Award 
for the year, uh, which is a big deal. Uh, but it turns out that that was the astrophysicists, but the astronomers <laughs> who are doing observing are also at Santa Cruz, and they have several, uh, they're members of several large telescope surveys that are going on uh, with um, uh, the computing being done at NERSC, uh, one of the telescopes is in Chile, one of them's at Palomar, and essentially they're looking at the whole sky at night and, they're, and anything that cha moves, changes color, or uh, changes magnitude compared to the way it was last night, uh, and that's what they do at NERSC is compare them, then an alert goes out to go look at that spot. And uh, it can be asteroids, it can be supernovas, it can be a lot of different things. But you can see we're talking, you know, nearly a terabyte per night. Uh, and uh, many of you probably know about the uh, large-scale synoptic telescope NSF is building uh, that'll go actually have its first light uh, next year, and that's between Chile and the computing, which is in CSA, is two 100 gigabit optical fibers. Now, they're looking at billions of things in the sky, most of the observable universe. And within minutes of the observation, the notification that something changed in this piece of the sky as they go across the sky, uh, it goes out to the observers. You know how many alerts? We used to call them as a person who did observational astronomy uh, in multiple ways, radio, optical, x-ray, satellites for years. Um, we used to call them telegrams, right? Well, they're 10 million a night. So we are gonna need machine learning just to figure out what to point my telescope at or which satellite. Uh, every night. This starts next year. So what we're using is these smaller ones to get the use cases. How is it that the uh, end users, not the people you know, bringing the data from Chile to NCSA and computing on it, so, but all those people around the world who are going to use it, how are they going to use it? How are they going to say, let me have all the novi for the last you know, three months in this section of the sky? So give me that subset of data, right? And, and so we're figuring out how to do that and, and how to build a software to make that possible. Now the NSF has also funded in many of your campuses uh, what are called cyber engineers or cyber teams. And these are really important people. This, for instance, uh, Shah Dong here, who's been very helpful. Uh, this is him receiving his uh, rack-mounted Fiona, um, uh, is what's coming from astronomy and, and physics, and so he he knows the science, but he also can work with the networking people, and these people are just incredibly valuable. If you have one, find a way to keep them. Let's go to, to uh, human uh, genomics, and in particular, cancer genomics. As you know, the revolution in cancer ter therapy has been not that I've got breast cancer or ovarian cancer or brain cancer or whatever, it's cancer is an information disease, you know? the cell that became cancerous was your human cell and it had your DNA and now it's got mutated version of that DNA in that cell. Well, where are the mutations? Because that's the cancer you've got. Because that's what it's interfering with is, is whatever those turn out to be either control or, or genes or something. So all of the data from patients is all over the country, NIH put together into a single database, which uh, was housed at, uh, this David Hausler was a, a PI, he's at Santa Cruz. He put this at uh, the San Diego supercomputer, why? Well, look here, this is the downloads of that data to the community I was talking about, <laughs> but now uh, imagine healthcare facilities all over the country. Uh, that's eight gigabits a second in June of 13. Here we are, uh, this is two years ago. It's essentially sustaining 10 to 15 gigabits a second. Uh, and this is over, you know, uh, weeks. So these are the, it's not like I'm inventing this networking stuff because I like networking. It's because the need has already been there, but hasn't been met with a solution. Then, 
as often happens, the grant ended and went to uh, the University of uh, Chicago. And uh, so what was, how are we gonna do this? Well, it turned out because we're at Starlight and because we worked for many years with Chicago, we could just flip our uh, links over to the Chicago and it just keeps going because anybody who's coming into the PRP, it, they wouldn't really notice the difference. Now the amazing thing is, as we begin to get some of these successes, and I won't take you through all the other fields, all of a sudden new people came to us and said, well, we have things we'd love you to work on, and so we, of course, aren't, quote unquote, funded to do that, but in, so we look at which cases, you know, make some natural sense. I'm just gonna take you through a, a few of them. First is Jupiter, how many of you use or know about Jupiter. Right, it's become essentially the lingua franca of data, uh, science data, uh, computing. And um, Fernando Perez developed it, uh, who was the developer of Python at uh, Berkeley, and we've worked very closely with him. So we plonked a big, <clears throat> what we uh, technically call a hunky uh, Fiona. Uh, down at Berkeley, and then we connected them with 40 gigabits, and so we basically now have this back uh, plane for California, and our goal is to have Jupiter everywhere so that anybody who's doing uh, data science is recording it in these electronic notebooks that have URLs, and then you just give somebody a URL like you would from Google, and they have the live software, the live data, and they can execute it, right? Um, and then for those of you who are in the social sciences and humanities, one of the things that has been going on a lot is cultural heritage preservation. Uh, and so uh, here we have uh, a project that we're supporting with Jeff Weekly here in the front row at University of California Merced, and that we're building these uh, kiosks, which are for virtual reality of, uh, for instance, either LIDAR or other ways of recording at incredible detail uh, cultural heritage sites uh, around the world. And in fact, we have a, a University of California Office of the President Catalyst Award to Tom Levy, uh, to, uh, who's one of our faculty, to uh, go to places that are in danger of either being blown up or uh, earthquakes or natural disasters, sea level rise, and record them in enough detail that we can study them essentially remotely and long after they're gone. Uh, and so they, these kiosks are tied together um, with, um, and you notice these are like 24, 48 megapixels, so 24 times or 20, 48 times the resolution of your desktop. Um, and all of the data is stored in these large storage systems. Um, then uh, the newest one, uh, which in California we care about a lot, is applying this to uh, wildfire early detection and uh, to following the development. And uh, this also got uh, one of the uh, scenic awards uh, this uh, last big meeting. So there are uh, uh, cameras that are out on wireless high-speed network that Hans Werner Braun developed under the HP Wren uh, NSF grant for about 15 years, and this is, shows you one in, in last October <clears throat> in near San Diego. And then we're also able to bring down the satellite images of the, uh, where the fires are, but also do predictive modeling now uh, quite accurately uh, in real time. So the way that HP Wren worked is that you have these, now they're up to over 200 megabits a second, mountaintop to mountaintop wireless uh, license backbone and then uh, down into the valleys where you can, it connects all the seismic sensors along the San Andreas Fault, it, a lot of uh, ecological uh, reserves uh, are on this and so forth. But there are cameras looking in all four directions uh, on all the mountaintops, and so we get early detection within 30 seconds or so of any plume uh, that is seen, and people are looking at automatic detection and things like that. Um, this just shows you just in 2014, uh, up north of where I live, uh, four simultaneous fires going on uh, during the wildfire season. And the thing you see in the lower left is the number of hits on the, on the servers. Now in the past, that data was just coming into a server, say at the San Diego Supercomputer Center or one at SDSU, 
But because those are all on Scenic, we just connect those servers with the PRP, and now, all of a sudden, you have data redundancy, you have disaster recovery, you have high availability during these 10 to 1, 100 to 1 spikes of people hitting. Because when the fires go, this is about the only place you can go to look and see is the fire coming toward you. And so there, the public, during the most, you remember the Napa Sonoma fires in October and then uh, the Ventura LA San Diego fire in uh, December, uh, we had during the Napa Sonoma over 800 million hits, uh, uh, eight, no, 800 million individual users <laughs> and millions of hits. So uh, Ilkay Altanis, who's the chief data science officer at San Diego Supercomputer Center, has an NSF grant called WiFire. I'm co-PI on that. And what we can do is take in these, uh, there are about 250 meteorological sensors on, in San Diego County alone on this uh, that SDG&E, our, our utility, has put in place as well as that. So, and then we have the weather for you. So we basically have all the weather data in the United States on a giant fire hose that we hook into. And, and so that goes through PRP uh, into the uh, Comet supercomputer and through a workflow I won't take you through. Uh, but it takes all these different layers of the landscape data. So we go into lots of databases that indicate the area of California that is involved here What's the vegetation, water, is it you know, paved, is it whatever, all that. And then we have more and more uh, both helicopters, fixed wing planes, uh, drones under the proper control of the fire authorities, not amateurs. Um, and this gives us information about the wire, wire, uh, fire perimeter. And that goes into a code called Firesight, which then I think essentially if you know the topography, you know the wind field, right? You know the temperature and humidity, and you know what is the ground cover and its ability to burn or not. You can imagine that you can predict the fire, and that's what this does. And, and the, that really then leads to uh, these kind of fire maps um, that are being very widely used, and we're working directly with most of the fire authorities in uh, California on this. Well, a different one is, you know, uh, just like the other weekend, um, San Francisco and um, Half Moon Bay and so forth had, were totally drenched at Monterey because of what they called an atmospheric river. Well, that's the way the Pacific Ocean's evaporated moisture ends up going across California. And if those rivers hit you, you get this real deluge. If they don't, you get drought. And so there's a center uh, for uh, Western weather and water extremes at the San Diego uh, University of California um, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And then up at Irvine, there is a place uh, that I was just visiting uh, with Sarus Sarusian, a very senior guy in atmospheric science, that keeps track of all precipitation events worldwide. So you can imagine downloading that and down into the uh, script center to actually then forecast the precipitation or not, which in California is more or less life and death. And, and so we've hooked together these two centers along with NASA um, and so forth. It was taking 20 days <laughs> to move the data for one computing. That's not going to help you a whole lot for the weather forecast. Using the PRP, we've now got it down to 20 hours, and by the end of this year, it should be down to 20 minutes. Now, if you're doing science, doing it once a month, one step of science or one step of public awareness, you know, predicted, prediction of weather, once a month versus once a day versus once an hour is completely transformational. But, and this is taking me toward the last thing I want to talk about, which is um, they have this huge object database. So imagine a thunderstorm, convective storm like this, you know, I, we used to do this at Illinois, and s simulating these. Anyway, it comes up like this, forms the anvil top, but it's also racing along the ground at 50 or 60 miles an hour as a nonlinear, self-excited entity in the atmosphere. Um, and they keep track of those precipitation events as they evolve, and that's an object. And then they put that object in an object database, right? And then they do this for everywhere in the world <laughs> for years. 
Now you want to go in and do machine learning on this to begin to understand where precipitation events are more likely to begin and where they go and so forth. And, um, and so that we're now working on adding machine learning there. Here's another thing where machine learning is coming in. This is an undersea microscope that we hooked up. We put fiber off the uh, Scripps Pier into the ocean. And now this thing can look at these uh, zillions of phytoplankton, zooplankton, uh, which are the base of the food chain, among other things. Uh, they're one of the things with ocean acidification. These things have car calcium carbonate skeletons, which dissolves as the sea gets more acidic from a and absorbing all the CO2 that we're putting in the atmosphere. Uh, you know, just diatoms. Every fifth breath you take, the oxygen in that breath came from the waste product of the diatoms in the ocean. So if these guys go away, you're going to be sucking hard to get that air. And so fundamentally, understanding the biology and ecology and the changes in this is very important. Well, this thing has now gotten, when I made this slide, 300 million images, which now need computer vision and classification to understand what's going on. Um, it's now over a billion. So uh, we put another grant together, which has been funded, uh, started last October, uh, which is to build a cognitive hardware and software ecosystem on top of the Pacific Research Platform, because now we can store the data, move the data, compute the data, so everybody wants to be in to do machine learning on the data. Um, and uh, so what we realized is that we had these Fionas, and um, they are PCs. <laughs> And in the back are slots. And you can put eight gaming NVIDIA cards in the back, 32-bit. And uh, these are, can be fully uh, containerized, uh, run Kubernetes, and um, run a wide variety of algorithms. So these GPUs, now if you go to Amazon Web Services or, or any of the high performance centers, they all have the 64-bit double precision NVIDIAs. And these things in these PC form are somewhere like, you know, an order of magnitude uh, less expensive. The noise in the data that you're working on is such that doing it in double precision is not actually getting you a higher accuracy. Now there are moments where you do need double precision. By all means, you should use the uh, NVIDIA cards that do that. But for an awful lot of academics who also are much more price conscious than corporations, um, this is quite a change. But it gets better because the CPUs and GPUs are both von Neumann architectures, which we've been working you know, 60 years, 70 years on. But there's this whole new set of, as we begin to reverse engineer the brain, which is really picking up speed, the idea of getting uh, architectural notions from the way nature evolved over millions, hundreds of millions of years, uh, information machines, uh, is leading to things like IBM's True North. This is the cover of science uh, almost uh, four years ago. And this is a spiking neural net uh, hardware accelerator. And uh, uh, Devendra Moda, who is a product of, uh, PhD product of UC San Diego, is the IBM chief scientist in this area, is talking about these parallel things. Uh, well, the first thing Lawrence Livermore did was get a 16-way one, and then more recently the Air Force got a 64-way one. Uh, so this is beginning to be parallel neuromorphic computing, and you're beginning, if you look around, you'll read that the Chinese uh, and um, the uh, Japanese are building uh, AI supercomputers. Uh, and, and so machine learning accelerators are, are really a big thing. So I started uh, with, uh, this is our most senior professor, uh, Ken Kreuzigato, in machine learning algorithms, uh, a pattern recognition lab at my institute at Cal IT2 uh, now two and a half years ago. And this is in that box is the first of the IBM True North chips coming to San Diego. 
So the idea is, whenever you hear about deep learning and, and, and AI and everything, what they're really talking about is multi-layer neural nets, an idea that is 30 or 40 years old. But because of the vast rise in data and computing power is finally becoming possible to be used quite generally. But that's only one of the different modes of machine learning and statistical machine learning that people use. And so we are taking all these algorithms uh, and putting them in our pattern recognition lab and then optimizing on these different architectures and then doing the measurements of the energy efficiency, in which case it may be several orders of magnitude, less energy than say a GPU or a CPU, uh, and then also the speed. Well, this time last year we had essentially zero GPUs on the San Diego campus. Um, I convinced uh, Mike Norman, who ran the Supercomputer Center, and Frank Bertheim, uh, we mentioned before, that there was going to be a need for these for science applications because of the rise of data science. And so they got 48 of those. Uh, our virtual reality cave alone has 70 of the uh, NVIDIA 1080 uh, um, GPUs. And then we have another 48 sitting around on other things that we do with visualization. This grant will provide 96 more. And then something you all should be thinking about, if your campus is going to be competitive, it had better be getting an undergraduate major and a graduate major in data science. And for instance, our undergraduate major in data science at UC San Diego starts this fall. It currently has zero undergraduates. In the fall, it will have 700. Now, where are they going to do their computing? I can guarantee you that many of these campuses do not have any GPUs for their students. And so we talked to Vince Kalin, a very forward-looking CIO at San Diego, and we now have 88 of these. And what they did was they just took our Fiona 8s, the Fionas with these, and we just racked them up, and then they made them available, and they put four courses through in which the students now can run their algorithms on the GPUs and get that experience. By the way, the way I figured out that this was something to do is I was standing outside the, the coffee cart between Cal IT2 and the computer science building, and I heard these students behind me. They're saying, man, you know, if I haven't done a project using TensorFlow and run it on a GPU, I can't even get asked to an interview. But that's not enough to just have the GPU. So around this whole thing, we're building over the PRP a cloud, multiple clouds of alternative architecture, such as the 64-bit uh, GPUs I mentioned that are both in the NSF Exceed resources and in Amazon Web Services. But then AIST, we've worked with them a long time over in Japan, and they're just building a, um, a, uh, a it's like one of these AI uh, deep learning supercomputers with over 4,000 NVIDIA 64-bit uh, tensors on them. But then the non, -Voyman, non von Neumann ones. Um, so it's not rocket science. Basically, Google, once it decided, once the CEO said, you know, we're going to put deep learning in everything Google does. And then the, you know, the guys in the back room came back and said, uh, you know, that's going to be a lot of computing, right? <laughs> and he says, yeah, yeah, well, we got a lot of data centers. Yeah, well, we're going to need another couple, you know, 12 or, or more, you know, $100 million data centers to do this. And somebody said, wait a minute, what if we just go into TensorFlow and look at the compute intensive core, and then we turn that into an ASIC, a specially designed non von Neumann chip that accelerates just that and doesn't do anything else. And that's their TPUs now. And they are, as a result, they are, uh, didn't have to build any of those data centers, and it's the use of those TPUs that actually allowed them to beat the Go master, the Go champion. Um, Microsoft has done the same with FPGAs, which have been around 30 some odd years, field programmable gate arrays, another non von Neumann architecture that is programmable in silicon, and they're now putting one of those in every one of their Bing servers. So this is not esoteric, this is totally routine. You, every day you're using them and you don't even know it. Um, IBM, we already talked about, and then there's a ton of new startups that are doing. Um, uh, neuromorphic uh, 
New Edge in, our, in San Diego. Another San Diego was Nirvana, which Intel bought. So Intel's now integrating a machine learning accelerator into its own uh, GPU because it bought it to Altera, and then it's uh, uh, and their FPGAs as well. And so they're they're you know that's where Intel sees it. It's integrating all these. So, but I just want to make it available to academics, so we can you know keep things going. Well, the last thing I'll say is that there's been so much interest in this that we were asked to uh, uh, have the PRP fund a um, uh, national research platform workshop. So we have no, we have been told by NSF in our five-year grant, you should at least explore what would it take to scale this. We're not supposed to go build it. We certainly don't have the resources to do that. So we actually pulled together a lot of the regional nets and a lot of the other folks who are interested in it. And we're having a second one uh, in August in Bozeman, and, and the registration is now open. And particular, like I've done for the last 10 or 15 years, we're working with minority-serving institutions and EPSCOR, um, the underfunded NSF states, uh, to get them uh, access to a set of uh, workshops that are uh, very hands-on, very hardcore uh, workshops in, in all this uh, in, in the four days before this workshop. Well, um, the final thing I'll just mention is that we've also gotten a lot of international interest. We actually had the Netherlands uh, as a part of this, so they have a Fiona over there now. Uh, but then I just was talking to Chris Hancock, who's head of RNET, the network in uh, Australia, uh, uh, mentioned Japan, we're hooking up with them, and KISTI in Korea, we just showed that you can get a five gigabit per second disk to disk to Korea. And this long distance TCP IP used to be the bugaboo of networking. Uh, it works just fine. And even Guam, you wouldn't know it, but Guam has become a new center in the Pacific for fiber optics and a uh, big, big thing going on there. So I'll just leave you with this. Fundamentally, after all these years, 30 years, we finally have built an, uh, this uh, thing. It's, it's, of course, just a you know breadboard, fun fundamentally, I mean, with SDN coming, software defined networking, and a number of other things. By the time we're ready to deploy this nationally, say 2020 or something, uh, what we made it is not what it'll be built out of. But we just showed that it's possible and we got the user use cases. But I gotta say, there's essentially nobody in digital libraries, nobody in data discovery, annotation, curation working with us. We'd love to do that. So if you're interested in that and, and you have a way somehow you'd like to get involved, we can't fund you to do anything, but if you want to, no, almost everybody in this project is unfunded as it is, including me. Um, so uh, we've now got this uh, massive amount of, of storage, but, but as you well know, there's a big difference between working storage and archival storage. That's not sorted out as to how we're gonna deal with that and who's gonna do what, who's gonna do, it's the same big problem, but now massively larger. And then how do you get application teams who are doing just fine doing their science the way they're doing and writing a lot of scientific papers to adopt this? How do you think of the new cybersecurity at these speeds, of course, obviously, if something goes wrong, it goes wrong really fast. <laughs> and so cybersecurity is really important. And then, and then I believe we're just gonna be adiabatically in using the cloud much faster than people tend to think. Uh, so Kubernetes is gonna help there. But I can tell you that this is not mainly a technical problem. You know, this is fundamentally a social problem <laughs> and a social challenge. And uh, that has, it, um, you know, just the networking experts that we've gotten, we have 20 or 30 of the top networking experts in the West Coast, they all just did their local thing. We got them two years ago starting to have one hour phone calls every uh, week to debug the big graph I showed you, the big matrix, to figure out why all of a sudden some green thing had gone red. Uh, and, and now they just take it for granted. They're all collaborating together. That was a social transformation. Anyway, many more. Uh, thank our sponsors and take your questions. I'll start us off. That was wonderful and terrifying, really, <laughs> both at the same time. I'm, I'm so inspired, but I'm also just really, really worried. Because um, 
to your point about the undergrads were standing behind you chatting about needing to know TensorFlow, and you know, that, they're, they're the, on the plus side of the digital divide. My campus, which is Davis, has, you know, 30,000 students now who are on the other side of the digital divide, and they, they're showing up for classes just to learn basic Python, R, Jupyter skills, you know. I don't even know how to begin to get them to awareness of this, and, and they're in fields like environmental science, biology, they're the next generation of science. But, you know, how do we even begin to get that divide um, a little closer together uh, when it's just getting worse every day? Well, you know, there's a variety of divides. So in particular, there's the age divide. So the younger they are, the more likely they are to be picking this stuff up on the street. Um, if they happen to be computer science majors. Well, you know, it's really amazing what kids think is reasonable to do these days. <laughs> and, um, you know, not back in my day in the 60s, you know, I mean, that was, we were like really well behaved. Um, but, uh, it's a great question, and I think it, it's going to make, there's going to be a new digital divide among campuses between those that understand the future's already here. This is not about the future, it's about the past. And are deciding they're going to move aggressively in that direction. And you see that all over the, camp, all over the country, campuses setting up digital uh, data science initiatives, majors, uh, hiring people, uh, uh, Berkeley is going to, I think, in the next year or so, require every Berkeley undergraduate to do anything that has involved something that's digital on Jupiter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the campuses that aren't even started on this, that's the new digital divide. And so I, I think that's why I'm here to give you a talk. This is, um, it's not like I need to sell you anything. The exponential has been coming for a long time. It isn't like we didn't know this was coming. So, you know, but academics are pretty slow to move. And this is pretty fast to change. Well, and our educational systems aren't set up to, to keep pace with this degree of change. You know, it takes years to get a new class approved, much less a new major. And so well, um, is there a different model we should be looking thereby, at? Thereby, you know, if you have to sit around and talk about what are the multi-hundred billion to trillion dollar a year industries in this country that have not yet been digitally disrupted? And I would say the two biggest ones are the medical community and education. So I think that the time for total disruption in both of those areas is uh, the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I don't mean to scare you, you know. Um, I'm curious if you have thoughts about the impacts on preservation of all of this work and like research reproducibility, because the, the, the level of infrastructure that you're talking about here, um, as someone who does work in software reservation, and like you know, you're talking about like custom TPUs and all sorts of custom hardware and things like is there embedded thoughts in all of this about how to like replicate some of this in the future or like you know preserve the containers that type of stuff is that part of the conversations um, not nearly enough I mean it ought to be auto the metadata ought to be auto generated uh, as to what was the container what was the version of the software what was the path that went through you know all of that stuff should just be automatically collected I mean the software knew it at the time mm -hmm. um, and there are examples of that. But that's why I'm saying the people who are experts in that area, metadata is just the most important thing. Uh, you can't really do decent data discovery without it. Uh, I ran a Gordon and Betty Moore $25 million grant to build the first global microbiome repository for data. And, and we made it, met, you couldn't put the data in without the metadata, and then we set up so you could do metadata searching on it, not just data searching, which is what still pretty much is done even at national repositories like GenBank or NCBI, things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why I say, it, yeah, I mean, 
Well, that's what Vince Cerf, who's, you know, I've worked with for 30 years on my advisory board, he's been talking recently about the coming dark ages where basically all this stuff just disappears because nobody's paying attention or putting enough resources in to um, understand that if we don't do what you're talking about, <laughs> it'll disappear. Okay, as long as it's there somewhere. <laughs> I keep coming back to seeming negative, but I mean, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's so much fun doing this. And, and, and so I, I think also, you know, most of you, if you're on campuses, will find that you are on the map. And so you have somebody who's, uh, you know, a cyber engineer or you've got, a, you've got a CC grant. Look them up. Figure out where you are. Who's doing what? What's in, you know, going on in data sciences? Yes, sir. Uh, John Gonzalez, Engine at Archive. Um, this, uh, this is a really great stuff, really appreciated that. One of the things I was curious about is at the end of the Fiona's when you're um, you know, downloading these massive amounts of data, I, I get that you need to do it in SSDs, but then where does it go? I mean, once, once the, the, you know, it piles up at the end of the pipe, I assume, but then how do you drain it from the Fiona's? Right, so we can put uh, <clears throat> just commodity disks, say 160 terabytes of rotating storage. Mm -hmm. As well, and so the, the basically the SSD acts as a capacitor to the um, first, first uh, rotating storage, and then beyond that, you know, we're putting this we're putting out two petabytes. But if you look at, I mean, how many of you you know use Open Science Grid or know anybody who does? Okay, do you realize that Open Science Grid, which which is basically linking together in a high throughput environment clusters all over the country delivers more CPU hours per month than all the NSF exceed supercomputer resources put together, just to the academic community, and, to, and about half of it's uh, particle physics uh, calculation, but the rest is biology and chemistry and all kinds of things. They're deploying a, a very large distributed data system as well. And I think actually the distributed data systems here are more exciting than the computing piece <laughs> uh, because it's, it's all about the data stupid, you know, so uh, in the end of the day. Yes, Jeff. So um, maybe a, a, a softball or a lighter question. Um, in all your long years of doing this kind of work um, and as you started as an astrophysicist, what was the one sort of discovery or um, uh, event that delighted you the most? Can I, can I talk about physics? Absolutely. The discovery by LIGO of the gravitational radiation from the colliding black holes uh, two years ago that won the Nobel Prize last year. My PhD thesis was I was the first person uh, to take Einstein's equations of general relativity and their full nonlinearity to put them on a supercomputer and calculate the head-on collision of two black holes, which the term at that time was about five years old, um, and calculate the gravitational radiation that came off of them. And then I held a world uh, gl a global workshop for two weeks and wrote up, edited the book, Sources of Gravitational Radiation. And the first chapter was by um, Ray Weiss, who got half the Nobel Prize, and the third chapter was by Kip Thorne, who got the other part. So I waited 40 years for that moment. And, and I believed, you know, that it was inevitable. It's the, you know, you're, you only have to measure 100,000th the diameter of a proton out of five kilometers uh, variance, you know, time variation to see it. So it's the most, probably the most sensitive experiment humans have ever done. And it took the National Science Foundation amazing patience and commitment to build two generations of LIGO at over a you know, billion dollars uh, just in the belief in the laws of physics. So that was pretty exciting. Number two, you work for the library. <laughs> Thanks, all of you. Well, thank you for that tour through the present and the near future. Um, it, it's striking, you know, listening to that, how much of 
the kind of predicted future is really here, um, running today. Uh, and I think there's a very important uh, message to take away from that in terms of the genuine urgency of um, grappling with some of these developments. And I uh, thank you enormously for opening everybody's eyes to that. This is, um, this has really been wonderful. Thank you so much, Larry. And we will have these, um, these uh, slides available because I know a number of you will want to track some of these individual projects and things like that. And with that, we are adjourned. I wish you safe travels. Um, I hope to see most of you in December, and I'm sure I'm going to see many of you in many other places between now and then. Thank you for coming.